Yes. I'm sorry, I will have to be sure of that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, uh, so the log normal behavior were initially observed in the X-ray emission from the uh, from the galactic black hole binary Cygnus X1. Just a minute. We should. Okay. Fine. <clears throat> so, uh, so this log normal behavior. Uh, okay. So here I show uh, the the mathematical function of the Gaussian and the log normal probability density functions. Uh, such that the log normal function is uh, nothing but the Gaussian one, except the variable x is replaced by its logarithm. And uh, here I will briefly explain how the multiplicative process can explain. Sorry, here I go to mention one thing that uh, uh, when the uh, log normal uh, variability uh, were initially observed in the x ray emission uh, uh, from the galactic black hole binary Cygnus X1 and uh, were usually interpreted as uh, the variation in the from the accretion disk which are multiplicative in nature. So here I will briefly explain how the multiplicative process can explain the, uh, uh, the log normal behavior. So here, uh, if you consider a, a process like uh, capital X is a summation of many sub processes, X1 plus X2 plus X3 and so on. And if the number of sub processes that is uh, N is sufficiently large or tends to infinity, then according to the central limit theorem, the distribution of X will lead to Gaussian. Now, if you consider the case when capital X is a multiplication of many sub processes, and if you take a logarithm on uh, them uh, on both sides, then log of x will be a summation of log of x1 plus log, log of x2 plus log of x3 and so on. Therefore, if and if any sub uh, tends to infinity, then according to the central limit theorem, the distribution of log of x will be Gaussian. Therefore, the distribution of x on logarithmic scale is Gaussian. Therefore, the distribution of x is log normal. So this log normal behavior have been observed in many galactic as well as extra galactic sources. And that uh, leads us to suggest uh, that there might be a disjet coupling. However, the, uh, the fluctuations in the accretion disk may not produce the minute scale variability, which are often seen in many blazars. Therefore, uh, as an alternative to the accretion disk model, uh, there is a mini jet in a jet statistical model, which is used to uh, explain the fast variability of high energy emission. And, uh, and uh, this is produced, the, high, the, the fast variability is uh, Produced in the relativistic jet, sorry, what happened? Hmm. Uh, and this fast variability is produced in the relativistic jets uh, uh, through the additive process, which is contrary to the multiplicative process, uh, which are connected to the accretion disk. So this such model, uh, such model can explain the log normal flux distribution in blazars uh, through uh, through the summation of uh, emission from a large collection of mini jets. Uh, which are randomly oriented in the relativistic jet. Uh, however, while this model, means a synergy statistical model, can explain the uh, log normal flux distribution in blazars during, uh, seen during very fast players, the long term non nonlinearity in the light curve is uh, difficult to accommodate by this model. Therefore, we present an uh, alternate interpretation uh, of the log normal flux distribution in blazars uh, through the by introducing a uh, small fluctuations in the particle acceleration time scale. So uh, here uh, I show a chosen scenario where the to model the blazar emission, we consider the case when the shocks uh, are uh, propagating uh, through the jet and uh, the uh, the relativistic particles are uh, getting accelerated around the shock front. And then uh, subsequently, uh, they diffuse to the downstream region where they lose most of their energy through the radiative processes like the synchrotron and the inverse Compton processes. So the region around the shock front is called the acceleration region and the region downstream is called the cooling region. And uh, these are the kinetic equation which describes the uh, evolution of the particles in the acceleration and the cooling region. So here in the acceleration region, uh, this is the acceleration term that the particle accelerates at a rate one by tau wave. Uh, here, this is the cooling term in gamma square, and this is the uh, escape of particle 
uh, at a rate run by tau a from the acceleration region into the cooling region. And uh, this is the injection pump uh, in the acceleration region. Uh, similarly, in the cooling region, this is the cooling term. This is the injection of particles at a rate one by tau a into the cooling region. And this is the escape of particle uh, from the cooling region at a rate one by tau a. So uh, in the steady state uh, case, uh, if we consider del and del t equal to zero, we, we will get the steady state solution of the kinetic equation in the acceleration region, which is shown here. So uh, now, uh, if you want to see uh, that how a perturbation or how a, a small variation in the acceleration time scale can introduce a variation in the particle number density, uh, we, uh, uh, we take derivative of logarithm of this uh, equation with respect to acceleration time scale, and we get uh, this uh, equation. So uh, here, uh, these are the, uh, the, the relative amplitudes are, uh, are uh, defined here by these functions, two functions, f gamma and g gamma. And uh, for the case, uh, gamma x tends to infinity. So gamma x is the maximum uh, uh, energy that an accelerated electron can attain. So for the case gamma x tends to infinity, f of gamma will tend to one, and this g of gamma will tend to log of gamma naught by gamma. Now, if you put uh, these uh, functions into, into this equation, we will get, uh, this uh, this one. So uh, this is this is uh, an interesting equation where where if we consider only the first term on the right hand side and if we take integration on them, then a of gamma will be proportional to tau, a, which means a Gaussian perturbation on the acceleration time scale can lead to a Gaussian uh, particle number density distribution. Now if we case if we uh, consider only the right hand, uh, only the second term on the right hand side and integrate them, then and uh, integrate them, then log of n would be proportional to tau, a, which means the the Gaussian perturbation on the acceleration time scale will cause the log normal particle number density distribution. And uh, also we can uh, estimate the electron Lorentz factor for which the log normal term uh, dominates over the Gaussian term. So here is the a limit uh, where uh, uh, where if the Lorentz factor, electron Lorentz factor is much, much greater than gamma naught times exponential of tau a by tau a, uh, the log normal term will be dominant. Uh, similarly, we, uh, we see uh, the, uh, how the perturbation on the acceleration, uh, how the perturbation on the escape time scale in the acceleration region can uh, uh, introduce a variation in the particle number density. Uh, so we take derivative of logarithm of this equation with respect to tau ea. Tau ea is the escape uh, of particle in the acceleration region, and we get uh, this solution. So from this solution, we we see the particle number density distribution will be neither Gaussian nor log normal. However, it will be a skewed one. Uh, after that, uh, to quantify the deviation of uh, uh, Gaussianity from the particle number density uh, of the particle number density. Uh, uh, we simulate here the temporal behavior uh, of the kinetic equation. Uh, uh, sorry, by solving the kinetic equation, the acceleration region uh, numerically using the finite difference scheme. And uh, then the Gaussian perturbations with varying with delta tau a and delta tau a are then introduced in the acceleration and the escape time scale. And uh, the time series uh, spanning over 5,000 points of n gamma is then computed for uh, each case at different values of gamma. And uh, uh, the, the, low, the lowest and the, uh, the, the minimum and the maximum Lorentz factor were kept fixed at 10 and 10 to 5. And uh, the generated time series were then uh, investigated for various uh, statistical properties. Like, uh, okay, so uh, like here, I plot uh, the skewness of n gamma. Uh, as a function of sigma tau by tau a. So skewness is the third moment, uh, while uh, the skewness zero uh, implying the symmetric distribution. And if the skewness is plus one, that indicates the, the distribution is perfectly rightly skewed. And if it is minus one, that uh, indicates the uh, perfectly negatively uh, skewed distribution. Uh, so here we see uh, for, uh, for gamma equal to 30, the skewness is negligible, which is suggesting a symmetric distribution. However, the distributions are highly tailed for increasing values of gamma. Now, uh, if you want to see whether this highly tailed distribution can reflect a log normal behavior, we plot here the skewness of log of n gamma as a function of sigma tau by tau. 
And here we see the skewness for the higher values of gamma is neg negligible, is supporting a log normal behavior. Uh, to confirm this, we uh, fit here the normalized uh, particle number density distribution with the Gaussian and the log normal PDF, where the Gaussian is represented by the green dashed line and the log normal by the this blue line. So here we uh, we see uh, the the log normal PDF uh, fits the distribution significantly better than the Gaussian one. And also we estimate uh, the um, we estimate the normal uh, the average uh, particle number density with its variation uh, by by dividing the time series into fifty equal time beams, and then we calculate uh, the correlation or uh, we perform the correlation study using the Spearman rank correlation. So here we see the Spearman rank uh, correlation study suggests the two uh, two fun two uh, quantities the uh, are uh, uh, strongly correlated with the correlation coefficient 0 0.83 and the probability null hypothesis probability 10 to minus 26. Now uh, uh, here uh, here I plot the skewness of n gamma as a function of sigma tau by tau. Uh, that is when the uh, when the escape time scale in the acceleration times uh, acceleration region is perturbed. So in this case also we see the similar behavior as before, like uh, the the distributions are highly tailed for uh, increasing values of gamma, and uh, we see the similar behavior. Uh, the distributions are tailed uh, when we plot the skewness of log of n gamma. So this suggests that the distribution will be neither Gaussian nor log normal. However, it will be a skewed one. And uh, here we fit uh, the the histogram uh, with the log normal and Gaussian PDF, and we can see the distribution will be neither uh, Gaussian non log normal, as it cannot be fitted with uh, any of these functions. And uh, here we see uh, uh, we see a uh, 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 mild positive uh, correlation between the between the particle number density and the, its variation with the correlation coefficient 0 0.26 and the probability 0 0.007. So. Finally, uh, this uh, study is used to interpret uh, plausible uh, cause of variability seen in the light curve uh, from the Maxi observations, the nine years long Maxi observation for the brightest uh, blazer MK41, uh, where we collect uh, the, nine, uh, the nine years long uh, index light curve, photon index light curve, and the, the flux light curve. And here we see the speculative index distribution is Gaussian, while its uh, flux distribution is log normal. Now these results can be connected uh, to this, uh, like uh, uh, I have already shown here uh, before that uh, the 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 particle uh, uh, dense number density is uh, is uh, uh, proportional to gamma to the power minus one minus tau by tau, where one plus tau by tau is the particle spectral index, and we can estimate the photon spectral index, uh, which is uh, tau by two tau. And uh, in general, uh, flux as a function of energy is proportional to energy to the power minus uh, photon spectral index. Now, if we take log on both sides, then log of flux will be proportional to the index or is proportional to the uh, acceleration time scale. Therefore, uh, Gaussian perturbation on the acceleration time scale can lead to a Gaussian uh, index distribution, photon index distribution, and that can cause the log normal flux distribution. After that, uh, we uh, performed the flux and index distribution study for a more number of blazars. And uh, we get uh, uh, the, uh, we get, uh, and we, we, we used for uh, one FSRQ and two BLX uh, using the Rossi x Time Explorer archival data. So, so uh, we, uh, we collect the 16 years long say, flux and photon index like first for the, for the FSRQ and the BLX. And uh, so here I'll be showing the results for one FSRQ and one BLX. Another BLX is MK501. I'll be showing for one BLX because the results for the two BLX are similar. So <clears throat> we perform here the anderson darling test uh, where, the, uh, and where the, the null hypothesis of the anderson darling test statistics is such that the, the distribution uh, the, uh, the distribution of the sample data is drawn from a particular, sorry, the sample data is drawn from a particular distribution. So like uh, here we see uh, the, the normal distribution 
and uh, the edit statistics calculate the probability null hypothesis probability such that when the probability p value is less than 0.01 that indicates the deviation from the gaussianity of the sample and then we perform um, uh, the histogram study of flux and index and uh, then we perform the correlation study between these two quantities so here we see uh, for the fsrq 3c273 the p value of uh, the flux is negligible uh, while the p value for the log of flux is uh, greater than uh, 0.01 which suggests that the flux distribution is log normal while the p value uh, for the photon index is uh, 0.14 so also suggesting that uh, the photon index distribution is gaussian on the other hand for the for the blac m can put to one the p value for the flux and also for the log of flux uh, are negligible which suggests that the flux distribution will be neither gaussian nor log normal and also the p value for the photon index is uh, less than 0.01 suggests that uh, the photon index distribution is neither not gaussian so here we plot the histogram of uh, the fsrq 3c273 and the mkn421 so uh, this is the histogram of the uh, photon index and this is the histogram of the log of flux uh, where we see uh, the the index is perfectly fitted with the gaussian function uh, probability, uh, probability density function and uh, the log, log of flux is also uh, the flux is also fitted with the log normal function and uh, here we plot the correlation uh, between the index and the log of flux and uh, this is the base fitted uh, line the dashed line so uh, here uh, we see that uh, the the center the center of this uh, two uh, distribution functions are kind of coinciding on the base fitted line may suggest that the log normal flux distribution is associated with the gaussian index distribution uh, on the other hand for the blac mkn421 we uh, where the ad test results uh, uh, say that the flux distribution will be neither gaussian nor log normal and the index distribution is not gaussian so there we see the double peak structure in their uh, histograms so uh, like for index uh, this is the double gaussian this is fitted with the double gaussian function and the flux is fitted with the double log normal function and also here we see that the uh, the peak uh, of the corresponding uh, distributions are uh, kind of coinciding on the base fitted line may suggest that the double log normal flux distribution is associated with the double gaussian index distribution so here i show an example of uh, this is the uh, broadband acd of the uh, of the fsrq 3c273 which is taken from tele 2020 and this is the broadband acd of the mkn421 so here for the fsrq we see the x-ray emission uh, the x-ray spectrum uh, is uh, lying before the peak uh, may suggest that the x-ray emission is associated with the low energy uh, electron uh, uh, low energy end of the electron distribution while for the blac the x-ray emission is uh, uh, lies beyond uh, is lying be, uh, beyond the synchrotron peak and might suggest that the the x-ray emission is uh, associated with the high energy end of the electron distribution uh, therefore the flux distribution of the fsrq at x-rays uh, may suggest that the low energy emitting electron have a single log normal flux distribution while the flux distribution of the uh, mkn 4 to 1 at x-rays uh, might suggest that the high energy uh, electron distribution uh, 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 might show a double log normal flux distribution. So uh, after that, uh, we perform a, a broadband NCD modeling of a, of a Blazard PK 0 to 08 minus 512 uh, during the gamma ray flares in uh, 2019 and 20. So here. <clears throat> Uh, here we perform the broadband NCD modeling uh, of the source, uh, due, uh, including uh, uh, the equation state and the active state of the source. And uh, these states uh, were selected, uh, 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 and this selection were, were made uh, uh, such that each state uh, is uh, uh, each state has a simultaneous data at the gamma ray, X-ray, optical, and UV observations. And uh, from here, uh, from the gamma ray light curve, we calculate the fastest gamma ray variability time scale, which is two days. We, and using this variability time scale, we estimated the size of the emission region using this formula. And uh, we also calculated the location of the emission region from the central region and the size of the VLR. 
So uh, the location of the emission region is uh, 5.2 into 10 to the 17 centimeter, while the size of the VLR is 4.2 for 10 to the 17 centimeter. So this results may might suggest that the, the emission region, uh, the location of the emission region uh, can be uh, close to the VLR or at the uh, boundary of the VLR. So uh, the broadband ACD modeling uh, of the source during the different flux states uh, uh, have been performed using the one zone uh, electronic model. So in this model, we assume a scenario where the non-thermal emission from the blazars is originated uh, in the spherical block of radius R, which is moving down the jet uh, with the bulk flow in spectral gamma at an angle theta with respect to the line of sight of the observer. And uh, the spherical blob is, uh, is filled with a magnetic field B and uh, uh, populated with the uh, broken power electron distribution. So uh, here, the, the quantities, uh, capital K and gamma, these are the nomination and the electron loan factor. And the power line indices before and after the break uh, are denoted by P1 and P2. Gamma and gamma max are the minimum and maximum loan factors. Uh, so, and gamma is the loan factor corresponding to the break energy. So, so uh, the observed the broad, uh, broadband uh, uh, emission uh, uh, is modeled with the synchrotron and the inverse Compton uh, process, uh, emission uh, radiations and uh, 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 during modeling. So, so, so the model is actually governed by the many parameters like, uh, uh, like the normalization, the, uh, the P1, P2 values, uh, P1, P2 and uh, the, uh, gamma B and the R, uh, uh, theta, magnetic field, etc. So to constrain the parameters, uh, we enforce an additional uh, equipartition condition here uh, be, uh, between the particle and the magnetic field energy densities. And uh, uh, these are the ACD modeling lasers. So our ACD modeling lasers, sorry. So our ACD modeling lasers uh, uh, suggest that uh, during the cohesion state, Okay. Uh, so, so our ACD modeling results uh, suggest that during the cohesion state, uh, uh, during the cohesion state, the gamma ray spectrum uh, can be explained uh, uh, by considering the external Compton scattering of uh, the uh, the. Uh, infrared photons from the dusty torus while the flare where uh, while for the flaring state uh, 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 an additional photons from the broadline region is required uh, in addition to the the infrared photons from the torus so these results uh, suggest that the, the emission region uh, um, suggests that during the cohesion state the emission region is away from the vlr while for the uh, during the flaring state the emission region is uh, near to the broadline region or PLR. And uh, also we see uh, the, the marginal increase in the magnetic field during the flaring state uh, 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 can uh, explain the flux enhancement. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, it can also be associated with the, uh, with the uh, efficiency of the particle acceleration process during the equipartition uh, that the particle acceleration is uh, more efficient in the flaring state as compared to the cohesion state. And uh, so, yes. Uh, so uh, the conclusions uh, I have already been saying. This during clearing states, the target photons from the BLR and infrared torus are responsible for the external Compton emission, and that that uh, that is suggesting the emission region is close to the BLR. While for cohesion state, the target photons from the IR torus are sufficient for the external Compton emission, and that uh, suggests the emission region is away from the BLR. So. Yeah, so these are the summaries that uh, Gaussian perturbation uh, in the acceleration time scale can give rise to a log normal flux distribution and uh, the linear flux RMS relation at high energies. So in other words, the log normal flux distribution can be a result of Gaussian var uh, variation in the index. Uh, and additionally, our results show a skewed particle distribution that is neither Gaussian nor log normal while we introduce a Gaussian perturbation on the escape time scale in the acceleration region. So in this case, the spectral index distribution will also be a skewed one. Uh, however, it will not be; it will be neither Gaussian nor log normal. 
and uh, it is found that uh, the extra variability of the market in uh, four to one is driven by the Gaussian fluctuations in the acceleration time scale and not uh, by the escape time scale. So, uh, and uh, okay, for, for the HSRQ in the next work, for the HSRQ 3C273, the flux distribution is uh, log normal with its uh, index distribution as the Gaussian. And this study can be interpreted in terms of the Gaussian perturbation in the particle acceleration time scale. On the other hand, for BLF, uh, which exhibits a, a double log normal flux distribution, uh, and uh, uh, while their index distribution is double Gaussian. Uh, so, like uh, there are many blazers which show the double log normal flux distribution. Uh, however, uh, what causes the double log normal flux distribution is not known yet. But in our work, we showed that the double Gaussian index distribution can be associated with the double log normal flux distribution. And uh, in our future work, we can also uh, we can also check uh, whether this, uh, now the question is what causes the double uh, double Gaussian in index distribution. So that can be associated with the two different Fermi acceleration processes, like uh, the first order Fermi acceleration process or the so shock acceleration, where the charged particles uh, get energized by uh, repeatedly crossing the shocks. And another is the second order Fermi acceleration process or the stochastic acceleration where the charge particle gets uh, energized by multiple scattering of uh, uh, of the um, uh, magnetic inhomogeneities, uh, which are associated with the uh, fluid flow, inhomogeneities in the fluid flow. So, so, uh, so yeah. With this, I will. I would like to end my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalia. I think we have one information that. Somebody else was supposed to give the talk this week. There was another speaker, and the speaker suddenly cancelled the day. And then I just called up Rukaya, and she's supposed to leave for South Africa this Friday. Tomorrow. Right? Tomorrow. Day after tomorrow. Day after tomorrow. That's this Friday. I said, My God, it's good that our work is on Wednesday. So, in probably in just two days' notice, she said, Next day, I said, Okay, ma'am, I can leave the college. So, I think I want to say this is because that's the kind of students. We have dealt with for years, and that's the kind of commitment they show to their work and also to their alma mater. So that's another reason why we are very, I'm very proud of the time. Okay, so time for questions. Questions from the audience? Yes, Ashi sir, you have 10 15 questions? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so you have, uh, so this. Uh, Acceleration time scale distribution that you are putting. So that is uh, there is a uh, so it has a prediction about the correlation between the index and the and the And it showed that correlation. It seems that it, it's flatter when it's brighter. That is uh, when the flux is I mean when the blazer is bright then the index yes. is flat or yes. is steep. Which one? Uh, if you mean to say this one, okay, this one you are saying, right? Yeah. Yes. So it is uh, steeper. Yes, right. it is getting steeper. Yeah. So, but so first of all, uh, that will depend on the range of wavelengths that you use, right? I mean, here you are doing this for a particular range, which is two to twenty k. <clears throat> but also uh, will depend on the synchrotron peak of the pressure, where the synchrotron peak is, because. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, it will not be the same for a low synchrotron peak and a high synchrotron peak. Right. But anyway, even if, I mean, let's say you are talking about a blazer where you have all these things, but is that true for all blazers that this happens, that, uh, that this steeper when brighter thing happens? Uh, you know, it may not be true because we get uh, uh, the, the other relation as well, right? When it is getting flatter when it brighter when flatter right. so so it depends again on the peak of the uh, synchrotron frequency however here it is uh, the fsrq and the blf so for both the cases we see the same behavior that's right uh, yeah so uh, i'm not sure whether maybe for but is the, that consistent with the observation yeah that we need to check with many number of sources here. any other questions yes sir I was asking a similar question to our 
like these two sources you are saying that correlation <laughs> and uh, so how do you choose these two particular sources is because they are uh, much well observed and they are right class yeah so uh, that's the two, two uh, sources yeah so, what will happen to other sources? Yeah. So in this case, this is the Rossi X-ray timing explorer uh, uh, observations. This light curve. So, so for, in order to perform the flux distribution study, we we need a long term light curve. Uh, like here, we get a uh, sixteen years long light curve. And uh, also, since uh, the RXT is pointing observation, so there are many gaps in the light curve. So we need to beam them. Uh, be, uh, we need to. Uh, in the data in order to minimize the gaps in the light curve. Uh, so for this particular sources, or three sources, there is one more MPN501 source. So for these three sources, we get uh, enough uh, data or enough number of observations in the light curve. So that is how we chose this for our work. Study more like uh, giving uh, observations to the proposal for other sources? Sorry, for what? For not for our experience? Not so I, I didn't get your question. No, are you planning to give some proposals so that uh, you can yeah. uh, do this kind of studies for other sources? Yeah, and like uh, like currently we have uh, Fermilat, we have a very good observations and also Swift, uh, we, uh, we keep uh, proposing uh, for uh, the data for the long term uh, observations. And uh, yeah, those are there. Uh, okay. Good. Any other questions? Yes. Origin. Yes. 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 Yes.
give us any information on microwave correlation or anything when you do not have adequate data yeah. in other wavelengths. I'm just maybe I'm missing something. So any reason why you this we, one laser why you picked that? Yeah, we we yes. I mean in this case we can't perform perform the correlation because we have very less data in other wavelengths compared to Kamali. Uh, so uh, here, uh, this is the, I think this is the fastest clear that uh, we observed during 2019 and 20 for this particular source. So we, we just, uh, with the given data, we, we are actually trying to understand. So the, I, I think, uh, my, then my question yeah. is that you have this set of information that you extracted for this particular pressure. Yes. I mean, why is the multi wavelength coverage helping? Why? How do you get it? In, in, yeah, in what, order to what, produce... What, could you have not done just by looking at the gamma ray light curve that you needed all the other observations? That was, I think, my question. That what is the yes? Uh, so, uh, like, uh, so the motivation behind uh, uh, studying the broadband ECD modeling is to understand uh, that uh, what are the physical processes or the physical quantities uh, which are responsible for the flux enhancement. Right, like when the source transits from the low flux state to the high flux state, and for that, uh, these uh, this information are actually enough to uh, to produce the broadband ECD modeling. Uh, so, I mean, and this, the, these numbers that you got, these numbers. Yes, where yes. did you get this from? This you have to use all the light curves, or just the gamma oh, rays? Just the gamma ray. The fastest gamma ray variable time scale is two days. Okay. Yes, this is just the gamma. Ray. Yeah, that's so. Yes, you want to say something? Did the ECD. Yes. Or in three epochs. Yes. One epoch is that first, uh, first dash uh, vertical line, then the second dash vertical line, then another one. So all these things are, I mean, there's uh, Fermi is always observing all the stars. So that is, if it is detected, there is continuous light. Swift only observes when the pleasure is there. So if there is a brightening in lap, then Swift observes. So it observes. And so then uh, they have uh, gamma ray data, and then there is some X-ray, there is some UV optical. So, even if only one data point, it should be fine. So this is one epoch. So this is uh, so she has done SED in three epochs. Um, so then you can compare between the parameters of the two epochs. I mean, ideally, what you want to do is do it for hundreds of epochs. And then see how the changes are. So I just recently referred a paper where they have done this, not for this period, but for other things. But I mean, people use I mean, not always that that many epochs are available. So you, you do what you what you have. Yes, yes, yes. You have so, a you have other questions? No, I don't have that. <laughs> so okay. So is there any other question from? If not, then I'll ask a couple of questions. There are other leisure experts here who are not speaking at all. <laughs> Too busy, <laughs> busy in working. At least uh, <laughs> so, so one is uh, so this uh, so this is related to what uh, Origit was asking. So um, you are assuming some Gaussian distribution of acceleration time scale. Yes. And that is giving you some log normal distribution of fluxes. Yes. Now, uh, in terms of the fluxes, we know, I mean, not only the shape, but what kind of variability is there? That is the lowest flux and the highest flux. What kind of this difference you expect? Mm. That is known for, for a given measure over 10 years, we may expect maybe a factor of 10 or something like that. Now, do you have any idea about the numbers? That is, I understand that from a Gaussian shape, you can get a log normal shape. Yes. But what about the numbers? I mean, numbers. to get the to get say factor of 10 variability in the fluxes, what kind of variability in the acceleration time scale is required? That is, can the acceleration you're saying? So what is the range of acceleration time scale? Because anything can be Gaussian, right? Yes. If, if a delta function is also Gaussian. Mm -hmm. So, what kind of uh, numbers you are talking about? Yes. Like here, if you see this plot, <clears throat> this units versus sigma tau by tau plot. Other, other, that, okay. so, <laughs> this one, yeah. yeah. So, here you see the fraction, the sigma tau by tau. The fraction is like 0 0.25. And okay. uh, I think I have not shown that plot where we see uh, the 
the variability, the extra variability in the in that particular MKN photon source. Uh, for that uh, particular source, uh, the gamma range ranges from thousand to ten to four, I guess. So, 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 which means that here somewhere, like when the uh, sigma fraction, when the sorry, when the fraction of the acceleration time scale is fifteen to twenty percent, uh, that can produce the log normal flux distribution uh, for the uh, in the X ray emission of uh, from MKN photo one. So sigma t is the standard deviation of the acceleration time scale distribution. Sigma t is the standard deviation of the acceleration okay. time and scale. Okay, t a is the mean. Mean, yes. Okay. So like uh, okay. even the index distribution, if you see like uh, sigma tau a can. Uh, so like uh, since the uh, photon index, the p is proportional to acceleration time scale. Therefore, sigma tau a by tau a, this ratio can be estimated uh, by. Uh, the the standard deviation and the mean of the index distribution. Okay. So, um, no, not, no. no I, I was going to talk about that because that's not obvious. Um, but so you have a very tight relation between the spectral index and the flux. Yes. It, it is very difficult to yes. not have the. Relation. And like uh, when the spectral index is a uh, p uh, is equal to tau a by tau e. So the escape time scale is uh, uh, denominator. So in that case, we see the uh, the flux distribution is not uh, neither Gaussian nor uh, log normal, but it's a skewed one. So that can also explain like p is proportional to one by tau e. So that can also explain the escape uh, the skewed distribution. The flux distribution is skewed when we part of the Gaussian uh, part when we part of the Gaussian with the Gaussian fluctuation in the escape time scale, right? Okay. So. And so the other we thing that, uh, I was asking is again, so um, you are connecting these two fluxes, right? So uh, yes. how do you go from in gamma so, to flux? Yeah, so just uh, you assume some gamma and then uh, in gamma and then it's just related to. Uh, yeah, flux. actually, we are assuming that uh, the flux distribution will follow the same, uh, uh, the distribution of n gamma. And I think it is the case of the synchrotron. Uh, so that is why we picked uh, the extremation of the uh, MKN four to one, which is due. But then three C two seven three three dash one. Uh yes, three C two seven three. Synchrotron as well as uh, ACC, I guess, because uh, the the particle emissivity for the synchrotron is proportional to uh, in gamma, right? But ACC is for ACC it is in square. Yeah. For ACC it is not valid. So, yeah. But not only for, that, but you also assume that the RMS is related to the RMS of this. I mean, RMS of the flux. Uh, uh, actually, it is not flux. It is uh, the average particle number density. No, that's what I'm saying. That when you are showing the RMS of the particle versus this, and you are, I mean, you are claiming that this is related to the RMS yeah. flux relation. Yes. So you are essentially saying RMS of this. Those will follow the same trend. Yeah. Okay. So yes, yeah, this is a good point that for ACC it is not actually valid because it will there will be a con convolution between two particles. Okay, uh, any other questions? If not, uh, before I thank the speaker, I just want to share this short story. This is <clears throat> Professor Michael Strauss. So he was a very senior professor at uh, Princeton. Uh, was visiting Princeton. And I think he was mentioning about you know, pleasures giving a talk. And then he was mentioning the work of uh, Zuha Fan uh, at Arizona, <clears throat> University of Arizona. So Zuha was uh, known for the fantastic work he did in SDSS in uh, discovering the very distant pleasures at that time. And he happened to be a student of uh, Professor Michael Strauss. So Michael Strauss said, oh, so that's a fan at all, uh, Zuha Fan, who was my former student. And oh, and then he said, see, this bad habit we always keep having is uh, we, this is a senior scientist in another university. And still, I take the chance to mention that this is my former student, this is my former student. So, so that's what I was thinking that, oh, Rukaya got her PhD going for a postdoc, but yet, uh, you know, hey, Rukaya, what is this? What is that? So still, this is a, this is a habit that many of I think professors generally develop that they can never get rid of the, the student connection, even when they become like senior scientists or whatever. So 
and I'm sure Rupa you liked it. But that's the story I guess just came to my mind. Okay, thank you very much, Rupa, and all the best for your new position. And thanks everyone for the colloquium. Okay, sorry, thanks everyone for attending the colloquium. <laughs>